Well, good morning, everyone. I am delighted to be here today with all of you. We're thrilled to have you join us and welcome to Campus Conversations, a webinar series that's hosted by the Consortium of Universities of the Washington Metropolitan Area. I am Roberto Cardano. I am president of Gallaudet University, and it's my pleasure to be here with you today amongst this distinguished panelists that we have this morning. Before I go there, I'd like to share a little bit of information about Gallaudet University. Gallaudet University is one of 17 other regionally accredited colleges and universities in the national capital region that makes up the members of the consortium. Through the organization and as incoming board chair, I meet regularly with fellow presidents all in this area. And we all know that many members of our community have some serious and reasonable questions and concerns as well about the COVID vaccines. It's also very clear that there's been some, in, some misinformation, both intentionally, unintentionally, purposefully, that's been proliferated, especially through social media. So in response, we as the consortium are hosting these panels with the goal of being able to provide you with direct access to unbiased experts from across the consortium of universities. We welcome your questions today. If you'd like to submit a question, please use the Q&A button and um, that will be available to you as well. There's closed caption that's available. Just go to the transcript, transcript icon at the bottom of your screen. And we do have American Sign Language interpreters as well for access. I am grateful to be joined by these esteemed colleagues who include, and I'll begin with introducing Dr. Andrea Anderson. Hello, Dr. Anderson. Dr. Anderson is a family physician and associate chief of Division of Family Medicine at George Washington University's School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Dr. Anderson is chair of the DC Board of Medicine and has been active in DC health policy and medical regulation, as well as teaching ethics, professionalism, and physician advocacy to medical students and residents. I also wanted to point out that Dr. Anderson has a strong history in community health services, serving underserved communities here in this country, and provides deep expertise and understanding of the needs for underserved communities in our healthcare system. So thank you for joining us today, Dr. Anderson. Thank you for having me. Also on our panel today, we have Dr. Wilbur Chen, who is the Chief of Adult Clinical Studies at the University of Maryland Schools Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health. Dr. Chen is an adult infectious disease physician scientist with a specific interest in clinical vaccinology and is devoted to developing vaccines for infectious diseases, specifically focusing on poor and economically disadvantaged countries and populations. Dr. Wilbur Chen was recently appointed to and nationally recognized to Vaccination Research Committee, the federal committee that is leading the uh, vaccination policies here. So thank you very much for being here and welcome. And I should also mention that you are a graduate of Howard University School of Medicine in 1999. I think you're the only one of us here who's graduate of a consortium of university university. So congratulations and wonderful to have you joining us today. Our next panelist is Dr. Jesse Goodman. He is a professor of medicine and infectious disease at Georgetown University, the director of Georgetown Center on Medical Product Access, Safety, and Stewardship. He's also an attending physician for infectious diseases at DC Veterans Administration Hospitals and has served as the former deputy commission for science and public health at the US Food and Drug Administration. And if I may add as well, he is a person who comes from Minnesota, um, a well-recognized researcher at the University of Minnesota in infectious diseases. And he will join me in acknowledging the significant day that is there with the Chauvin trial and also the difficult times that this represents for a number of people in our country. So I wanted to welcome you as well to our panel today, Dr. Goodman. 
Thank you. In addition, we have Dr. Gregory Washington, a fellow president at uh, George Mason University. He is the former Dean of the School of Engineering at the University of California at Irvine and former Interim Dean of the College of Engineering at Ohio State University. Under President Washington's leadership, George Mason has been a regional leader in vaccination efforts, already providing nearly 50,000 vaccines to the public. And uh, I can testify as a president as well, providing vaccines to our community is essential and being able to provide 50,000 is an amazing accomplishment. Um, yeah, I just, especially new incoming into your role. So I'm very impressed with the great deal you've been able to accomplish in such a short period of time. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Washington. So again, thank you all for joining us today and agreeing to be a part of this critical discussion. Our questions today were solicited from our students and our communities. And we do have staff today who are monitoring the chat function and the Q&A. So please feel free to submit additional questions you might have at this time. We'll get to as many as we can. This panel is committed to providing accurate information to our community today, as you all desire and, of course, deserve that information. So I'd like to start with the synthesis of one or two, maybe even three questions that came up most often when we solicited uh, the questions. And I'll start off with this one. Just give me a moment. So let me start with this question. How do we know the vaccines work? And what does it mean that some people are still getting the virus even after having received the vaccine? So I'll look to our panelists and just see if you'd like to share some opening comments about how the vaccines work and then what it means in terms of the possibility of getting uh, the disease after being vaccinated. Would anyone like to start? This is Wilbur Chen. I can go ahead and jump on this grenade. <laughs> no, this is a this is a great question, and and I want to just uh, thank uh, President Cardano for um, having this discussion this morning, and and thank the panelists as well. So I, it's super important that people understand that these vaccines have been under study, and uh, one of the studies, the pivotal pivotal study, uh, that allowed for these vaccines to be authorized is what we call efficacy studies. And this is where we um, vaccinate people with either the placebo or the active vaccine and then follow them very closely to see if they have the COVID illness. And after we've had a number of cases during this active part of the study, we unblind ourselves and look and see. And we discovered that these vaccines are so highly efficacious uh, that we had those 95% efficacies for at least the two Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines. And again, that's because we see the cases are among the placebo recipients and not among the vaccinees largely. And that's how we can derive those efficacies, those numbers that you hear about. And so I think that that's what um, really generates our, our great excitement um, and enthusiasm about the efficacy of these vaccines. Now that they are launched, we're seeing that people continue to have very low case rates, even uh, you know, when they're vaccinated. And some people do have um, evidence of the infection, even though they're vaccinated, but largely it's very mild infection or even asymptomatic infection. And so again, this all speaks to the power and the value of these vaccines. Yeah, I would just add, this is Jesse Goodman, can, can you hear me? Yes, please do. Yeah, I would just add that because people worry were these studied in the same way that normal vaccines are, well, these studies were just as large as the studies that typically are done you know, for approved vaccines in non-emergency settings. What's happened is because it's in the midst of an outbreak and then because their level of efficacy is so high, the data came in very quickly that showed their degree of protection. And now we also have six month data from both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines 
that shows that that more than 90% reduction in risk you know, continues for at least that six month period. So I think people can be uh, quite assured that they do reduce your risk of infection and particularly of the severe complications. Now, as more and more people remember that saying something is 90% effective is not saying it's 100%. It just means your risk is substantially reduced. And as more and more people uh, are vaccinated, we're going to see that, that there are more and more cases occurring among vaccinated individuals. But what's important to, is to monitor that their risk remains quite low, for example, in the face of, of the new variants. And data from Israel and the United Kingdom, where vaccines have been given to most of the population, suggests that uh, particularly for the Pfizer uh, vaccine, where we have the most data, that that efficacy is maintained and there is some protection that's significant against the current variants. Okay, so now might be a good time to ask another question around the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which has been put on pause. I think uh, Dr. Anthony Chapfousey just announced uh, that happening, and perhaps uh, information will be shared this Friday on what's going to happen with that. Given the information that people have, some people already having received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and concerns around that, and then after Friday, if the pause is no longer inactive, what would be your advice to the community and who's left wondering about if that single shot is, of course, more accessible, so many people might be interested in getting it, what are your thoughts around uh, the effectiveness of that particular vaccine? I'll take that one. Uh, you know, it's normal to feel nervous about anything that's new. And obviously the coronavirus pandemic is very new for everyone and the vaccines are new for everyone. So I understand people's concern, especially if they hear in the news that there's a pause, that there may have been, uh, that, that we have eight uh, documented case of a very rare blood uh, clot disorder. However, I would like to point out that we assume risk every day in our lives when we drive in our cars, when we eat outside, when we wake up. I mean, there's, there's always risk. Um, something like 20,000 fender benders happen every day. And, but it doesn't make us not drive in our cars. It just makes us be more careful while driving, putting on seatbelts, uh, obeying traffic laws, these things. So I would say these eight cases gave us a pause, but it was not a, uh, a notification for panic. Okay, we want people to still believe in the efficacy of these vaccines. The pause was to alert the healthcare community about how to treat and recognize this blood clot disorder, although rare, uh, and also to let us be on the lookout for any additional concerns. However, I still believe in the efficacy of these vaccines, in the research that has gone behind them. And I would say when the pause is lifted and hopefully it will be lifted, that we should still believe in these vaccines when we're faced with such a devastating pandemic and the devastating effects that it has had on our communities especially our communities of color, the economic impact, the impact on our students. I mean, the list goes on and on, right? None of us has not been touched by this pandemic and some have been really devastated by this pandemic, including the loss of loved ones. So when faced with this information, I still feel that the vaccines are the best hope for our society to get through this pandemic and get back to life as we knew it. So very helpful. I wanted to ask a question related to what was just shared. I have um, had some employees and students here at Gallaudet pose the question about, you know, the studies that have been done on the vaccine. Do they include large numbers of people of color as a part of those studies and what might be effective for our communities of color versus people who are not of color? Is there an impact on the vaccine efficacy based on that? And how would you address those concerns? I can take that question as well. Um, so, you know, my center um, has been uh, 
conducting some of those seminal trials um, for the Moderna study. And, and we're also in the midst of conducting the uh, efficacy study for Novavax. And we were very mindful to make sure that our study participants that volunteered for these studies ref re reflected uh, the communities of color around us. And so here in uh, Baltimore, uh, we, we did try to make sure that we had uh, the black and brown communities. We also have a community um, in Hyattsville, Maryland, in Langley, Langley Park, Maryland, which uh, re reflects the, the Latinx community as well. Uh, again, um, our site was one of the sites that had uh, the, the most uh, you know, proportions of communities of color. And again, it was very intentional because we want to, at the end of the day, ensure ourselves and the public that these vaccines are highly efficacious for everyone, the generalizable community, but also communities of color in specific. And that's what we've shown. When you look at the data and you break it down to uh, either uh, age, uh, race, gender, what have you, that you can see pretty much acceptable um, and comparable efficacies um, in all of these subsections of the population. And so that's all very encouraging. Certainly other comments from others around those uh, sentiments and concerns people have. There's a lot of historical racism in the practice of medicine over the years that's led to some suspicions that we now see emerging and especially seem evident in some of the questions we have today. And with that, let me, you know, as scientists and doctors ask the questions, how do you address the community who have had this history, who are somewhat hesitant about moving forward with vaccination? Uh, I, can, I can say that this is a very real fear and I acknowledge with my patients, with my family, with uh, uh, the African-American and Latino communities that this is a real fear. And we acknowledge that there has been a history of uh, systemic racism that has affected uh, the medical community as our entire society has been affected. Uh, and not even historical. I mean, we can point to current disparities uh, in outcomes and in treatment of, of people of color. So mm -hmm. this is a real fear. This is not something that we are uh, downplaying. However, I would say that with regard to the vaccine and with regard to its development, I would still encourage all communities to avail themselves to this protection. The data that we see, I mean, I can speak specifically to DC data, which we've been very transparent about in reporting. Something a little bit over a thousand DC residents have died from coronavirus since the beginning of the pandemic. And over 800 of those were African-Americans. Uh, we see disproportionate numbers uh, in deaths, in severe disease, and in the economic impact and trickle down. You imagine if you're, if the breadwinner of the family is stricken by, by uh, COVID-19, even if they survive, maybe they're uh, sick for a month, they're out of work, they may have lost their job. I mean, many African-Americans and uh, Latinx uh, residents might be frontline workers, may work in industry that's more impacted um, by the economic downturn. And so even if our communities are able to uh, survive the health impact of COVID-19, the economic impact is still just as significant. So I acknowledge this history and I can say that it's normal to feel concerned. However, this pandemic is killing all communities, especially African-American and Latino communities and uh, all communities of color specifically. And so while I acknowledge the fear, I would encourage everyone to still avail themselves to the vaccine so that we can get to the other side and continue to deal with these very real issues that are still affecting uh, other aspects of our healthcare. Thank you for that response. Can I add something else as well, which is that, um, you know, uh, there have been a lot of community uh, conversations that I've been very encouraged by 
to continue to talk to people about uh, their questions of hesitancy, which again, are grounded sometimes on the fact that there have been decades of uh, you know, misuse of biomedical research and other things. And so as we continue these community conversations, um, I've seen people's decisions change. And I think that that is reflected in the national polling that where you see the trends are you know, starting to uh, improve where people are less and less hesitant. But I also just use this as a reminder for all of us that even though we may get to the other side of the pandemic, there will still be health inequities that are present in these communities. And we as public health um, need to continue to work on those. You know, there's obesity, hypertension, cancer, and all these mm -hmm. other inequities out there that we need to continue. So this is highlighting these facts of inequity. And, and I want to just encourage the entire community to continue to rally around these themes to continue to push for health equity in general. So that's just to add on to what Dr. Anderson just talked about. Yeah, let me let me make a comment on this one uh, as well. Um, you know, the uh, look, it's an earned reality uh, what we're experiencing. Uh, you know, relative to having members of uh, particularly African Americans who are hesitant. I will say that I think the hesitancy issue is being focused upon maybe a little too much. Uh, let, let me put it in a broader perspective. The studies are now showing that there is actually less hesitancy in uh, the African-American community than there is hesitancy, say, amongst Republicans. They have a greater hesitancy. The challenge, the bigger challenge, the really significant challenge that we have seen in terms of our vaccine distribution efforts is actually getting vaccine to the communities. Many times it's hard to get vaccines in those communities. We, we literally had to set up uh, mobile vaccination clinics in churches, in the, we set up shop in parking lots in order to go to the community to get them vaccine. That to me is a far bigger problem than hesitancy. And, and, and so, but it requires us to rethink and do things differently. So, so when you look at the numbers and you see that there's a disparity in vaccine distribution, I would venture to say that it's probably emanating from the fact that you've got large swaths of people who want the vaccine. They literally want to, <laughs> they want it. They're not hesitant. They just don't have access. And the access problem is a bigger one. So thank you, Dr. Washington. I wanted to go back for a minute. I have another question here in a moment for Dr. Goodman, but um, yes, thank you for your comments thus far. Dr. Goodman, would you like to add as well? No, I think these are all great comments. I, I would point out that it's understandable when people wanna step back and wait, see that something is really safe, see that there's benefit, but a good time has passed since uh, these vaccines started being distributed. And we're seeing the impacts, for example, in the United Kingdom and Israel in reducing uh, the outbreak and deaths from the disease. We're seeing the impacts in nursing homes right here in DC. Uh, so I think, you know, important to remember that so far in this country, something like one in 600 people have died of COVID. That's a completely terrible and unacceptable uh, toll. It's higher in our communities of color and our lower income communities and the vaccine, getting access to vaccine is your opportunity to do something about it, to protect yourself and protect your families. So thank you for those responses. Um, I don't know if students are watching, watching, but you know, students always have an ongoing question on their mind. And so I wanna shift a little bit to the students' concerns that have uh, been shared with us, if you don't mind. Um, and this one is directed to a fellow president of mine, uh, Dr. Washington. 
um, questions about whether or not just George Washington, or whether or not your university, George Mason, will require uh, vaccines. And as we begin to consider reopening our campuses, where are your thoughts in this moment in terms of vaccines being required? So th this is a difficult subject. And uh, l let me tell you the broader picture, and then I'll focus a little bit on what we're looking at at Mason. Uh, right now, according to the Chronicle, about 32 institutions have actually now said vaccines will be required for uh, students to enter campus in the fall. Uh, there are three Washington area institutions that are amongst those 32, and that's American, Georgetown, and Johns Hopkins. Uh, a number of the rest of us, we're all in discussions and we're talking about uh, what we're going to do. I can tell you uh, that the direction that I am in right now is we are leaning in this direction, um, primarily because, you know, we want to be in accordance uh, with the Code of Virginia. And that Code 23.1-800 basically states that all students should be immunized, must be immunized. And, uh, and they list a whole host of vaccines that students must have. Uh, and while the, uh, the coronavirus vaccine is not listed in those entities, uh, the discussion now has shifted to in states, when, when, when there is a state of emergency, which we are still in, uh, universities for uh, public health reasons can make the decision uh, if their board of visitors decide that is the case to actually require uh, uh, vaccines. And so uh, while most of the 32 institutions on the list that I uh, pointed to you are privates, uh, I will tell you that a number of the public institutions are moving in the same direction. I expect that within the next two to three weeks as uh, vaccinations become more prevalent throughout our society as a whole, you will probably see more than half of the institutions in our area they will require. Um, and like I said, I'm expecting that we will too. We just, uh, to be totally honest with you, the J&J vaccination, the, the J&J vaccine was going to be the vector that we utilize in order to vaccinate our large populations of our students. We were literally slated to start vaccinating students with the J&J on the 21st. And uh, when that you know, vaccine was taken off the market, we really had to go back and recalibrate our, our plans because even if we give uh, vaccines to students starting on the 21st, the problem is, is that exams will be over and graduation would have happened um, before we can get students, a large number of those students, the second dose. And that would be a problem, right? Uh, there, you know, if these students, especially the ones who are out of state, there's, there's no, uh, agreements between the multiple, you know, different states that the students will be able to get their second vaccination there. And so it will, it could indeed cause a problem for those students. So we, uh, and that then makes it harder for us to mandate, right? So we are really trying to reevaluate what we hope is that by the end of this week, uh, that there is a lifting of this, uh, a band of the virus, of not, uh, of the vaccine, if nothing else happens so that we can actually uh, resume uh, the plans that we had in place. Right, so thank you for that response. I know we have a lot of students who will be listening to understand what that feedback is. So I am aware that in this conversation, we could of course go on all day about all the implications of what you've just described, including you know, remembering as you talked about access just a few moments ago, and how many people in this country still need access to the vaccines that can't get them. And there are also ethical, ethical considerations. I know as president of Gallaudet, those concern me as well, whether we should mandate the virus versus seeking various pathways where we would find that right balance in this country of making sure people have access to those who most need it the most 
And, uh, you know, very often when we think about other bits of information from other experts in our country, um, people such as yourselves, we look to experts to help us understand this. And this is a, a conversation that I'm sure will continue for some time going forward. And speaking of required vaccines, another question comes to mind. Um, this relates to the side effects of those vaccines. I know there are a lot of questions that we've gotten about those side effects and asking how dangerous are the side effects of the vaccines? How likely is it that people will experience side effects? What about the long-term effects of the vaccine? Um, you know, we've had such a short amount of time to study these things. So what could you share with the audience about the side effects of the vaccines? Who would like to start? Dr. Goodman, would you like to begin? Um, sure. So, you know, we're in the clinical trials, I mean, there are all there are several different vaccines, you know, some are still in development, et cetera. Uh, but in general, the benefits of the vaccines have far, far exceeded any of the side effects. Starting at the beginning, you know, I would say particularly for the RNA vaccines, which are Pfizer and Moderna's, a substantial number of people will get what we call you know, reactogenicity, which means your body is responding to the vaccine. And part of that is it's making a good immune response uh, against the COVID virus that will protect you. But so people will have a sore arm, uh, a proportion of people may have fever, chills, muscle aches, joint aches uh, within a couple of days of those doses. Those side effects in the people who occur them, and could they occur in, and I can say I got the, vex, the Pfizer vaccine and didn't have any, uh, except for a sore arm. I was lucky. My wife had chills and felt like she had flu for a day. Um, but those go away uh, within 24 to 48 hours. More, those are also less common with the other vaccine technologies so far like J&J. &J. Um, in terms of more serious adverse events, and that's what's being assessed now for the J&J &J vaccine. For the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, they've been allergic reactions and they've been very rare on the order of one in 100,000 or less, and those are treatable. Uh, so that's why people are asked to stay for 10 to 15 minutes after getting their RNA vaccine to be sure they're just fine. The other, there, there's an active monitoring system uh, involving reporting to CDC, involving looking at healthcare databases throughout the country. Uh, and that's what is detected, this very rare adverse event of um, uh, unusual throm thrombotic disease uh, with the J&J &J vaccine. It's something that was seen in Europe with use of the AstraZeneca vaccine, which involves a similar technology. We, as you heard, there's just a few cases of that in several million people vaccinated, about one in a million. But we're still finding out more. That's why there's this pause. And with the AZ vaccine in Europe, it was on the order of maybe one in 150,000 recipients that developed this. It's so it's quite rare, but it's still under study to see how rare. Uh, it does seem to occur more often in younger women, but at least with AZ, and we don't know that yet with Pfizer. But just to point out again, even if the risk was one in 150,000, that's hundreds of times the risk of less than, than the risk of one dying from COVID. So it's important to keep that in perspective. So we've got active safety monitoring systems. That's why there's this pause now uh, that to look at that and see, is it safe to resume? There could be recommendations that it preferentially be used in certain age groups, but let's wait and see what the expert committees come up with. Uh, there's no evidence of other effects so far, but you know the monitoring is continuing. But remember with the Pfizer vaccines, the Moderna vaccines, over 100 million doses have been given in this country with all this monitoring. And so far, they look remarkably safe. Yeah, I'll just jump on to that. What uh, Dr. Goodman was saying, you know, perspective is so important in this entire discussion. I mean, in our lives, right, as a whole. But in this discussion, our, the perspective is so important. You, you might see on social media, and I know lots of young people watching are on social media. and. 
uh, you know, people say, oh, the, the, those side effects, they took me out, you know, I'm laid out from side effects, you know, can't do this, can't do that. You know, and yeah, you pop, some people do have joint ache, they feel, they might feel nauseous, some people have diarrhea, you might have a headache for a few days, your arm hurts, definitely those things can happen. Um, but you were not laid out in a hospital bed, right? You were not, um, you know, experiencing serious side effects from COVID-19, including death. You were able to post on social media how you were feeling. Uh, so I think that, yes, while these side effects can take place, and I got the Pfizer vaccine in December, uh, like the second week it was being given, and I had arm pain, I had some achiness, I was tired, but I'm also a mother of two small children. So I got to take a nap, which was maybe a little uh, perk right there. Uh, but still, I gained the benefit of being immunized against this deadly disease. And so we want to keep this in perspective, encourage people to keep this in perspective. Few days of side effects versus long-term complication of COVID versus, God forbid, death from COVID. And when you consider it like that, few days of side effects are not, uh, I don't think they're significant enough for people to not be vaccinated. And I would hope that that would not be a reason for, uh, for people to avoid vaccination. We do see more robust side effects sometimes in younger populations. And actually that means that your immune system is younger and works better and is stronger. And so sometimes that, that means that it's doing its job. And so I would encourage people to not be uh, as concerned about the, the potential side effects. If possible, schedule your vaccine on a Friday or a day where you don't have to you know, work or do significant things the next day. So if you do feel fatigued or you do have achiness, you know, you, you do have that uh, leeway to take, you know, take it easy the next day, if possible. If not, still get it. Uh, and talk to your primary care provider, talk to your family doctor, if it's so significant afterwards that, you know, you're very concerned. But I think that you'll see, most people have seen that uh, the side effects were not as bad as they were concerned about. So I think you actually answered one of the other questions that a student had asked, and I would like each of you to share a comment, if you will, um, especially to people who are young, you know, young adults, as we want to advise them, and many of us affiliated with colleges and universities deal with young people regularly. So the question that was asked said, I'm a young person, and it seems like COVID is not very dangerous for me. Why should I be vaccinated? I mean, let other people get the vaccines first. I mean, why even bother? I'm a busy person. Why should I take the time out of my day to do this? So what would be your advice to someone who is young, who was talking about this? I know you've already mentioned some of the things around this about, you know, the long haul effects of COVID that uh, could perhaps be much more dangerous and prevented by the vaccines. But what would you share with someone who was young, who uh, brought this up, who may be watching now? Let's see, I can try to answer this one. Um, so I, I think, again, um, when a person asks that question, it's, of course, um, uh, you know, a self-based question in which they're assessing only their own risk. And, and yes, a younger, healthy person may not have the same risk as an older person or a person who has some of the recognized comorbidities like obesity, hypertension. Um, and so they may not have very high risk, but that's not no risk. And the second thing is, let's back up and understand that this is a pandemic that is affecting our entire society and the entire world, and that we need to be good neighbors to each other and recognize that until we can completely have this virus eliminated from transmission in our population, that we really won't effectively be able to open up completely and get, get back to normalcy. So even if you're asking that uh, question about yourself and, and risk, I think what you're also saying is that you, you risk then not being able to open up completely and being able to enjoy uh, a movie theater experience or going out to the restaurant, indoor dining or shopping or any of these other sorts of things 
where again, we are able to normally um, enjoy, but in the setting of a pandemic where the virus is, is easily transmissible in the population and a person can carry it very easily to a nursing home or other places where there will be outbreaks, where it could be carried to a person who's, who's immune compromised or an older person who may have a high chance of death with the infection. Again, that's the reason why we all want to get vaccinated is because we all want to get back to some sense of normalcy. And the only way to do that is through high levels of vaccination in our population. Okay, and Dr. Washington, as president of a university, what are your thoughts? What would you share with your students? Well, the, the main thing uh, that I would share is that the reality is you may not be, uh, you may not encounter significant uh, issues relative to uh, contracting the virus, but you are in an environment where everyone knows that, you know, professors tend to run all ages, uh, some very senior, and students will be in an environment where they will be coming in contact with those individuals. And if they're not taking any precautions and not doing the kinds of things that uh, they need to do, they can actually be an asymptomatic carrier and could actually infect uh, a professor or a staff member who will actually, uh, you know, get, could get significant, uh, uh, side effects or significant issues relative to contracting uh, the virus. And so uh, we just need to keep the whole community safe. And I, we, we've been doing is we've been encouraging our students to do so. Look, you are part of a community and because you are part of a community, this is what we do for everybody. So it's bigger than an individual and it's really about the whole team. It's really about the whole community. And, and so we're asking our students to help us keep our community safe, not just them as individuals. That's a great point. The, the data shows us that the numbers of new cases are rising the fastest in the younger demographic, right? The 19 through 40 year olds are the ones that we see higher numbers of cases. However, who is dying from COVID? It's their parents, right? The 60 year olds, the 70 year olds, the 80 year olds, their professors, their parents, their grandparents, their, uh, you know, aunties, uncles, uh, who, who, who name, you, you name it, right? So you as a young person need to be vaccinated to keep the people who support and love you alive and well. You know, we have not mentioned the concept of herd immunity. And that's the idea that uh, we need to get to something close to 80, 85% of the population being vaccinated to really substantially decrease the, the rate of transmission of this virus and to really reopen in a substantial way. If we're all sitting out the vaccine, if we're all on the sidelines and not participating, we are just delaying, essentially delaying the pandemic and essentially giving more time for variants to arise uh, that will continue to perpetuate this whole uh, uh, pandemic, right? So when you get vaccinated, it's like your body is recognizing a picture, like an, like an America's most wanted picture, right? Here's coronavirus, here's the bad guy, here's who you don't let in. Right, and if the whole neighborhood knows who the bad guy is or the bad girl is, then no one's gonna let them in, right? So that's why we need to get to a high number where all of our bodies know, okay, that's the virus. I recognize them immediately. I don't give that virus time to come into my body and ravage my body and make me sick. I'm, a, my, I'm ready to lock the door and let it out and keep it out right away. And when the whole community is like that, we would be able to get back to normal quickly. I was thinking one other thing I'll just quickly add. Um, this year I'm celebrating a milestone college graduation and in reminiscing with my friends from college, 
you know, we had such great times on the campus and walking around and student groups and all the different things that we did. And so I wish, and I know all the presidents here wish for that time when students can get back to a normal college experience, just hanging out with your friends, learning things. I mean, definitely all the universities are doing a great job in, in keeping that education going. And I know the professors are working hard virtually and making lots of changes, myself included. But so much of the learning from college happens outside of the classroom, right? Like on the campus green, you know, walking around, learning from others. And so the faster we can get everyone vaccinated, the faster we can get back to a sense of normalcy, not only for our universities, but for our society as a whole. Wow, I'm just uh, noting the time here. It looks like we have about 15 minutes or less remaining actually. And I did want to pose another question once again from a student. And I feel this is an important one. The students have asked us um, this question. I'd like for each of you to take just a minute or two to share some closing reflections to the community as well. What are the most important thoughts you have that you'd like to share with those who are watching around the vaccines? and safety and the community. But first to the question that was asked by a student. Uh, the student says, I am a person of color. How do I know that they're giving me a real vaccine and why should I trust the government? So would anyone like to respond to that question? Maybe a couple of you. <laughs> well, I can start. A great question for our MDs. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm willing to start and just say that <clears throat> there are very strong controls over the vaccines that are being made available under the FDA emergency use authorizations. You know, the whole supply chain uh, is controlled by the company and the government. You should be aware of uh, strange offers, things on the internet, uh, things like that. But if you're dealing with reputable uh, healthcare systems, reputable pharmacies, reputable providers, you're part of a supply chain that is very protected. And as my colleagues mentioned, this is a, also in terms of the studies that were done to show these vaccines work and to understand their safety profile, they were unique in their engagement and involvement of minority communities. I'm hoping that it's a change in the whole medical research system where diverse communities are respected and included that can begin with the COVID vaccine. So I feel very good about that. Use common sense and you're gonna get a vaccine that's been properly handled, that isn't a placebo, uh, et cetera. Great, would anyone else like to respond? You know, I would tell people uh, first and foremost, um, they should have a healthy skepticism. And that skepticism is earned. Uh, it's earned by what we've seen happen in history. So it's okay for students to feel that way. Uh, but then I would caution them to do the investigation on their own. There are lots of independent verifiers of what's happening in our society today. The information doesn't all come from government. It comes from individual studies, from companies. You can see the data of what's happening in your individual states. And you can actually literally see what's happening in individual communities and cities where there has been a significant uh, intake uh, or significant adoption of the vaccine, right? The latest uh, being San Francisco. I mean, San Francisco's numbers are just fabulous. Now they're down to literally uh, 30 uh, cases uh, a week, or I mean, 30 cases a day or so, and uh, with uh, 20 people being hospitalized thereabouts, where they were in the hundreds before. Uh, and it's because more than 50% of their population in that city is actually vaccinated. And the data runs across all ethnic groups. And, and so uh, this is the kind of thing that I think people should investigate on their own. Uh, I'm not going to be one to tell them that you should think that everything is okay and it's now okay for you to trust the information that individuals are, are placed in front of you. I, I'm more for self-discovery, you know, 
having individuals go out, seek the data themselves such that they can internalize their own understanding and then act upon the understanding that they actually receive. So thank you for that answer. And um, I guess I'd like now to go to all of our panelists and ask you each to share some closing reflections or thoughts for the audience. Uh, we'll go in the order of first Dr. Goodman. Um, I'm just following who's on my screen, Dr. Goodman, Dr. Anderson, Dr. Chen, and then we'll close with uh, Dr. Washington. So with that, if you wouldn't mind beginning us uh, with your closing comments, Dr. Goodman. Well, I do think that safe and effective vaccines are have to be a huge part of our way out of this really awful year that most Americans have had and that have disproportionately affected the elderly, communities of color, et cetera. And I'm somebody who pushed and fought really hard that when FDA was under pressure from the Trump administration and others to stick with very high standards requiring very strong evidence from studies and an independent and publicly transparent vetting of the facts. And to the comments that uh, Dr. Washington just made, you know, these studies and the safety data are being uh, discussed publicly in advisory committees and that information is available out there for all of you to review. So I think these vaccines are incredibly important to getting us there. For people who are skeptical, young or old, I'd like to take your hand and take you around my hospitals where I see patients, take you to the intensive care units and see that these are people who are, as, as we just heard, the loved ones, the parents, the grandparents of all of us. And we need to work together to prevent that from happening. And to the college students, I would say, just like you never think a car crash is gonna to happen to you and you're safe and you're not gonna die, um, car crashes do happen to college students. And I do see college students end up in intensive care units also. So protect yourself, protect others, be skeptical, make sure you look at the evidence, but at the end of the day, you know, make a science-based decision. Thank you for that. Dr. Anderson. As a family physician, I've seen such devastation from this pandemic. And I would say, you know, this pandemic has been obviously the worst of times. We've seen the death, we've seen the economic destruction, we've seen the food insecurity, children, uh, you know, not getting what they need from, from their schools, you know, being virtual, missing out on important things like graduation, prom, you know, all of those things that are so important to our childhood. Um, however, it's also been the best of times in a sense because this incredible technology is available to us, this vaccine production and distribution and states really talking about how to put the public health of their citizens uh, at the forefront. And I think it's an incredible time for us to be able to participate in something that really can put this pandemic behind us. So I would highly, highly encourage everyone listening to avail yourself to the vaccine. I agree with Dr. Washington, do your research, have healthy fear, that's normal. That's how our bodies know how to stay out of danger. We, we wanna stop and think, however, once we do, I would really encourage everyone uh, to get your vaccine and to help us get to a point where we can get back to life as we know it. So thank you for having me on this panel. Wonderful, and now to Dr. Chen. So let's see, what can I add to uh, the comments already, which have been terrific? Well, I think again, let's think about the value of these vaccines. Uh, it might be a personal uh, you know, value for you in terms of what you gain from it. There's also the societal value as well that, I, that we discussed in which we can enjoy having uh, you know, business sectors and other parts of uh, you know, the public opening up so that we can get back to normal. And I think we talked about risk as well. You know, and I think that some of it is uh, perception of fear or distrust. And hopefully through these types of discussions, again, we hope that uh, we're moving that needle toward 
uh, that being less of a concern and being able to understand that a lot of the safety and the efficacy are again, uh, grounded in real fact. And so hopefully that will uh, decrease those reasons for um, hesitancy. And as President Washington also mentioned, I think it's important to recognize, of course, people may fully want to get vaccinated and there's the uh, problem of access. And so I think that public health officials are trying to develop better mechanisms. So in the next few weeks and months, you'll see you know, unique ways of delivering these vaccines to different populations. And even, you know, we should recognize for rural populations, it's hard because of even just geographic distance. So you'll see, you know, innovative ways where dentists, veterinarians will be able to deliver vaccines. Uh, they should be trained and then they will be able to deliver them. But you'll, you'll see again that uh, the, the pharmacist across the street in an independent pharmacy, as well as the national chains and other places will be able to deliver vaccines. And again, at the end of the day, uh, let's weigh the value of these vaccines, the true evidence for how beneficial they are against these risks, which hopefully we're addressing through these types of conversations, again, that they are really, really quite minimal, the true risks that we've seen with these vaccines. And so, again, I think the benefit far outweighs the risk. So my question to you is, now that we've had collectively more than 100 million doses of vaccines delivered, and we've seen the efficacy of these vaccines, um, how much more do you need to know to uh, be confident in these vaccines. So turn to your um, kind of community, you know, experts uh, around you to continue to have these discussions. Um, but hopefully again, all of you will get vaccinated and in turn turn into vaccine ambassadors and turn to your neighbors and try to also talk to them about the benefit of these vaccines. Thank you. Oh, and thank you very much. And now to Dr. Washington. Uh, if you would like to share some closing comments for our audience, for our communities. Well, I hate to go last <laughs> because everybody took the good stuff. But <laughs> look, the, rea the reality of the situation is this. Uh, if I go back to early January, uh, we had a peak of somewhere in the neighborhood of about 257 on weekly average, 257,000 people a day were getting the virus. And uh, it was, those are really, really dark times. Uh, we are down in the 60s now on a average, a per day average. And that's a dramatic reduction. Uh, this vaccine rollout has actually been a phenomenal success in my opinion. Uh, are there things that we could have done that were better? Yes, uh, but given that we had a rocky start, uh, things are going extraordinarily well. Uh, our job now is to get vaccines in as many arms as possible so that we can position our society to regain some semblance of a new normal. We know that that's coming back and I am just ecstatic in terms of, in, in, in terms of the opportunity that I see in front of us. We, we are going to beat this thing and uh, we're beating it. And I have all belief uh, that over time uh, we will prevail and we will get back to hugging and embracing and uh, having closer contact with one another. Uh, I don't know if that will be with or without a mask, <laughs> but at least there'll be some level of comfortability in terms of our engagement. Those times are coming back. We just need to stick to the plan just a little while longer. So true. So I wanna thank you all for your insights and your expertise, just in your ability to connect with our community given all the questions that were posed of you. Very, very impressed with what I've heard today. And I also want to thank our colleagues across the consortium and especially those here at Gallaudet University for the outstanding work you and everyone is doing on a daily basis, especially in these unprecedented times. You know, everyone here is representing a member of the consortium is signaling the role that we play in our community in this effort. 
You can find the prior panel in this series on vaccinations on the consortium website at consortium.org. And I would encourage you to join for the next panel that will be hosted by Howard University President Wayne Frederick on Friday, April 30th at 3.30 p.m. Thanks to our panelists for being here today. Thanks to the audience for viewing in. It's been a wonderful time here with all of you. Thank you very much.